let's get started with Market Design 101. So this is something that I shared in the first lesson of this uh, framework for token economics. And I said that we are going to focus on market design this time. And market design, we're going to look at thickness, no congestion, and safety. These are the three factors that we'll look at. So what's market design? As I mentioned before, market design is the environment in which your tokens and participants will interact with each other. And if you Google market design, you're probably likely to find this thing called kidney transplant. So um, how, do you, how do you design the market for, to allow uh, kidney transplant in the US? That was done by economist called Irvin Roth, did a very successful job, and it's one now a very big case study. Or you look at medical, medical students' job application. How do you allocate, um, how do you allocate um, medical jobs or jobs, uh, surgical jobs or doctor jobs to medical students? Or primary school choices. So how do you allocate um, students get to choose what kind of primary schools they want to go to? And the primary schools uh, will also approve of how many students uh, they can take in, which students they want to take in, and stuff like that. So these are examples of market design. And if you Google, there are a lot of them. But today, we're not talking about them at all. We're going to understand market design in terms of token ecosystems. If you are interested in all of these three um, examples of, of kidney transplant, medical schools, and primary school choices, I have them in the resource list that I'll share later. And they're very great papers. And if you're interested, happy to go and read them. Very interesting stuff. But we're going to talk very specifically about decentralized digital ecosystems, your token ecosystems. So what is, what is market design? Market design uh, is a form of micro microeconomic engineering. It combines two things, science and art. How is it science? Because it's science because it uses tools and concepts as well as models and theories to create this design system. But it is also an art because it uses practical design. As I mentioned before, sometimes we can make the most beautiful design on paper and theory in models. But when we're creating all these models and, and theories, we are constrained by a lot of assumptions that we make. Whereas it is a true art when you're trying to, when you're applying them to a very practical design, because then a lot of assumptions don't hold. Um, you have to look at new variables, new constraints, or new environment and new factors that will affect your, your solution. And it, it also, it's an art because it's a bridge to reality. It bridges from, from this models and theories and assumptions that people are rational, perfect beings to reality when it's actually not the case. So it's a, it's a mix of both art and, si art and science, science and art. We start with the science part and then we move to the art part where we have to do a little bit more um, creative engineering to implement and design these systems. So why is there a need for market design? Two reasons. The first one, markets are not stable. And when markets are not stable, markets are not efficient. And we don't like inefficiency. We do like efficiency. So we need to start designing stable and efficient markets. At the same time, markets also exist to promote certain kind of outcomes. We talked about this last session, talking about objectives and constraints and how, how it gets, how we want to optimize specific outcomes or optimize specific objectives that we want to put in place. And these are these, these objectives and, and outcomes are why market design or markets exist in the first place. So through, through market design, we can design a market that promotes the kind of outcomes that we want. So how does market design resolve these problems? The first one is when markets are not stable, what we want to do is to make it safe for transactions to take place within the market. So people can, can take place in the market, within the market and ecosystem instead of outside of the ecosystem. So if you think about trading your crypto kitties, so I've got, I've got crypto kitties and um, we want to, I want to sell you my crypto kitties for, if, for whatever money you give me, but we don't trust the system. We don't trust um, the crypto kitty system. And what if I put my crypto kitties there, put it on exchange and sell it to you. But in the meantime, it's lost. In the meantime, um, the code is deleted and my crypto kitty is just gone forever. So I don't think it's safe to transact within the, the marketplace. What do I do instead? I download the crypto kitties into a thumb drive and then I meet up with you in person and then you give me the cash and I give you the thumb drive and we trade outside of the ecosystem. So that really destabilizes the, the market because we want it to be safe. We want it to transact. We want people to transact within the ecosystem. So that's something that we will be talking about later. 
The other thing is we want to how do we how do we resolve the problem of, of outcomes? What we want to do is then to add um, rules and constraints to encourage specific behaviors in this marketplace. And these behaviors can be cooperative actions, can be incentives to incentivize individuals to behave specifically. We'll also be talking about that later. Now, what's the link to my token ecosystem then? Okay, it's it's nice, it's it's good. Um, transactions within the ecosystem that make it safe. Okay, what's the link? So the first one is to encourage good behaviors. You you want to because we want every every ecosystem has a has an objective. So it could be stuff like stability of the currency, it could be supply tra chain tracking, it could be having a lot of options for people to choose from and transact, transact there. So you want them to, you want to encourage good behaviors, you want them to follow the rules and constraints that we set in place. And we can design them through market design and encourage these good behaviors. The second is through market, through uh, market design, we can understand how market, how the market can fail and how can we mitigate these risks? Because the other important thing is that this is a decentralized ecosystem, right? It's not something like, it's, it's not like I can, it's not like an agile system where I can execute something, test it out um, with the decentralized ecosystem where everyone is together and say, okay, you know what, this, this fails, so let's, uh, let's re-edit this and uh, try it again. No, because when it's decentralized, it's very difficult to manage, very difficult to govern, and there is no central authority that says, okay, this is wrong, this is not good, we have to redo. So something that's very important in market design is to understand how your market can fail and how to mitigate that risk. Lastly, valuation of token ecosystems. And I think this is something that everyone likes to hear a lot. Good market design encourages participants in the network and by having active participation in the network, by having you know real value add to the network, it increases the value of your token ecosystem because people find value in it. So having good market design, having, having good designs, allowing people to transact within the place, it adds more value to people and your value of your ecosystem will increase. And that's, something, that's probably something that um, is important to a lot, of, a lot of your projects. So there was one on one. Let's go a little bit deeper because, and understand what's market design from, from a different perspective. What is market design? Firstly, it's a form of, of economic engineering. How do, we, how do we design these markets? Through formal rules to govern interactions. And why, why, do we need, why do we need market design? Simply because participants are naturally non-cooperative. So as we talked about that just now on non-cooperative game theory, unless there's an incentive for people to cooperate, there is, there is no reason for people to cooperate because people are intrinsically selfish. So with these rules to govern interactions, we can, we can help uh, to encourage cooperative behaviors or maybe we want to use rules to change the kind of incentive structures that's in, in the game. So there are many creative ways to play around with this. And it's maybe it's easier to start understanding how can we solve problems? How can we solve market design problems? The first one is to analyze non-cooperative non games. What do I mean by that? So we will we start with a situation when people are non-cooperative, because there's no incentive for them to cooperate, right? So in the, the most raw form, have an understanding of, okay, if people don't cooperate, this is how they behave, this is how they act, this is what actions they do, these are the behaviors they will, they will put in place, and this is the outcome. Then the next step is to look at incentives for individuals. So as economic designers, you or, and us, we can focus on incentives for individual behaviors. Then we can we can look at incentives by looking at the environment, the market, the ecosystem that we are designing, as well as the consequences of the actions. Then we balance both of them up and, and really frame, constrain or frame the incentives around these two factors. So the market that they are interacting in, which is your token ecosystem or the environment, as well as the consequences of the actions. So what does it include? Yeah, this is a very uh, familiar um, picture that you see, we, we saw this in the first lesson. So economics, token economics, or economics in general, it's mainly around three things. The first one is incentives, punishments, and behaviors. So how does market design, how is market design linked to these incentives, punishments, and behavior? The first one is 
We want to look at solving problems through incentives. It could be individual incentives, it could be collaborative incentives, cooperative incentives, but incentives. With punishments, we want to organize markets with punishments. Not just punishments, more like organizing markets with rules. So having incentives and punishments in place. We encourage people to do something with punishments. We organize and constrain their actions with, uh, no, we, we solve problems through incentives and constrain their, their bad actions with punishments. And ultimately with behaviors, we want to, we want to allow uh, individuals to make strategic behaviors, strategic interactions with each other and to consider behavioral economics in, in their behaviors, like the right? Because people are not rational and how do, we, how do we take that into consideration when designing your market? And why do, we, why do we want to study market design? I really like this uh, little comic because um, economic forecasting is, you know, it's a very complicated thing. It, it, it really is very complicated. You have so many factors and variables and, and considerations to, to, take into, to, to take into account when we're making, we're making forecasts. But it's almost like because it's so random, there's so many factors. Any any random amateur or any random person on the street can do that too. And the probability of anything happening exists. So it's quite difficult to make these kind of forecasts. So which brings me to the point of why do we study market design? Because traditionally economists we we analyze what has happened in the past, try to understand what has happened, why why it happened, and then apply them into ecosystem and make predictions from there. But with market design, it's slightly different. It's, it's about economic design. How do we design economics? We take a more proactive approach. We, instead of observing how markets behave, why do they do that? What can we predict from there? We can design how markets should behave. So with all these rules, incentives, punishments, we try to constrain the actions and behaviors of people in the market so that they should behave in that way that we design them to do, or we design the market to behave. This, that's a big difference. Instead of observing, predicting, we are designing proactively of how people should behave. And I think that's extremely, extremely interesting. Now then, what is market design? It's not like a formula, formula per se, but it's a general, general idea and formula of what you should think about in, in market design. It's general economics. So a lot of aspects in economics needs to be applied here. Um, game theory, we talked about cooperative, non-cooperative game theory. So they are big considerations that needs to be taken in place. Common sense, because a lot of common sense is needed. Experimental analysis. So something that we talked about just now was market failure, right? So design your market, test it out, understanding how it fails, why it fails, and then just apply your lessons learned and Together, you know, these five big factors coming together, we can design and implement actual markets. And this is, this is where it's slightly different from traditional economics, where we are just looking at more of general economics as well as not really experimental analysis, but more of um, empirical analysis to, to, to make sense of things and then predict markets. But now we are taking a lot more things into consideration and designing these markets and implement these markets which is very, very interesting. So there's three reasons why we should study market design. The first one is new digital markets because now markets have changed. Markets are, are digital, markets are smart. There are more factors to consider in markets and the market itself can take on a lot more um, variables. So by that, we, we can design new markets. We can make markets more efficient. The second is understanding market failure because markets fail. And how can we mitigate that risk? How can we prevent such failures? How can we foresee these failures? And lastly, what is good design? Good, by studying market design, we can understand what good design is and help to increase the valuation of our token ecosystem, as I mentioned before. So, market, new digital markets. So thanks to technology, now we are creating new smart markets. So these markets can take a lot, a lot, a lot of complex inputs and variables and determine the best outcome possible. possible. So an example would be in Amazon. So Amazon now allow you to buy, um, allows you to buy one item and you can, it takes in a lot, of, it recommends the best item for you based on the reviews of people, based on what they, what they buy, they suggest related products for you, they give like bundle deals or um, recommendations and they help us to be smarter. As an individual, I don't have a lot of time 
and if I just want to buy a water bottle, then I just go to Amazon and they help me. They, they help me. The smart markets would look at reviews by other people and tell me that, you know, by buying a water bottle, you're more likely to also buy um, running shoes and or like boxing gears because you buy this specific water bottle. And then it delivers the best outcome based on your choices available by looking at all the different various inputs. So it, it helps us to be smarter and these algorithms are, are also smarter to de deliver the best outcome. The other, thing, the other thing is market failure. So another reason to study market design is because markets fail. Markets fail all the time and it's common, it's okay, it's fine. You just go back and edit your, your design of the market. So they can fail in two ways. The first one is market institution. So that's your token ecosystem or the environment or the market. All the general tasks that the market performs. So it could be transactions, it could be interactions, it could be uh, whatever your market is designed to do. And, and the root cause of these failures are always the design factors, which we'll be talking about later. And understanding these, these design factors, understanding where it goes wrong, can really help us to mitigate the risk of failure. So in new digital markets, we're, talking about, we're usually talking about two-sided marketplaces. So we talked about that in the first uh, the lesson last week on, if you see this thing here, on uh, network effects in token ecosystem. And we're talking about two-sided marketplaces like, let's say, Amazon. So you're a platform that allows transactions to happen. So we want to, we want to encourage, so for Amazon, we want to encourage, or, um, yeah, we want to encourage um, transactions to take place on Amazon itself and not for people to search on Amazon for the best item and then privately um, speak with speak with the sellers to make private transactions. So there's something that Amazon doesn't want. That's where markets fail because people don't trust Amazon that they can transact there. They just go to Amazon to look for information. So it just it shows that um, Amazon's market has failed. Then what can they do instead? So they have, they have to look at other ways to mitigate the risk. An example would be stuff like um, having reviews. So when you transact there, when you transact on the platform, you, that's only when you can put reviews in. So sellers are more incentivized to want to transact on the platform because they want to get more reviews. Um, their reputation is also at risk. And um, for, for buyers, I want to transact on the platform because I've got uh, kind of like a buyer's insurance and buyer's protection that's protected by, insured by Amazon. So there are ways to mitigate these failures. Once you understand what are the failures, you can find ways to mitigate the failures. And lastly, what's good market design? So good market design allows trust to develop, and this is trust beyond the technology. I know we talk a lot about DLT, it's like a trustless system because we can trust the technology, everything's distributed, we can trust the information there. And we can trust the technology, that is good. But how can we trust the people in the space? How can we trust the participants? How can we trust each other that's beyond the technology? So what we want to do, we want to communicate. So there are two ways to do that. One is to communicate honest preferences easily, and one is to, to reasonably reasonably believe and trust others. We talked something we talked about something like that in the last lesson, lesson two, on incentive compatibility. We talked about DSIC, dominant strategy, and BIC, Bayesian, where people people can people feel safe enough to trust or uh, to communicate their honest preferences, and they also expect and believe that other people will also do the same thing, and they can trust people based on that. So you can design good. Good market design allows that to happen. Good market design allows us to, to trust each other honestly, allows us to, to believe others, allows us to, to be able to communicate our honest preferences because it's safe to do that. And what does it mean? Ultimately, it, it just achieves these objectives. I as an individual can achieve these objectives, but I can also reasonably believe and trust others because they are all honest. Everyone's honest like me, and I can trust that they will achieve the same results as if I'm doing it. So to put that into perspective, because I'm honest and and the, the the market allows me to be honest, the market allows me to communicate my points honestly, my preferences honestly, I can expect, reasonably believe and expect people to also trust and be honest. I can trust others. And because I as an individual want to achieve the objective of this market, because of these factors that I can trust others and I expect others to also behave like me. Together, we, whoever execute the actions, it could be me, it could be the other participants that I trust, will always achieve this objective. So a simple example would be, let's say you and your partner um, 
are uh, having a house house party and you have a, a friend you have two friends coming over so you guys can do two things one you and your partner can either one of you cook or one of you clean the house and I trust my partner that my partner can do both cook or clean the house and I reasonably believe that they can do things they can do that properly do either well and um, we can, it's also safe that I can communicate that I want to be the one cooking so my partner can be the one cleaning the house instead and can communicate my my preference my preferences honestly so no matter what we do we will achieve the objective of making a house clean making the having good food so that our guest that comes over can enjoy it together so something like that where where I can good market design allows trust to form and achieve these objectives that we want to achieve so that's that's a very quick basic introduction to to um, I can, uh, to market design and now we want to look at the three different factors in affecting market design so see this little flowchart thing over here so for markets to work well it needs three things the first one is to provide thickness to reduce congestion and to make it safe for people to transact what is what is provide transaction uh, provide thickness provide thickness is to make sure there's enough people in the in the ecosystem there's enough um, options available so that we can reach a suitable adoption level. I know we always want to talk about mass adoption and then the whole world using your ecosystem and, and marketplace. That's good. But right now we are talking about, you know, just like your MVP, your, your minimum viable uh, market size, uh, minimum viable adoption level. So we need to have enough thickness, enough participants, enough um, people in, a, in your, your market to reach this suitable adoption level. What does it mean by reduce uh, congestions? By reducing congestions, we allow transactions to occur within the ecosystem. We allow, we allow um, for maybe with, with the CryptoKitties case again, where instead of, the, uh, instead of transacting online, I have to download my CryptoKitties and then I meet you in person and we exchange. Maybe because um, during that time, everyone is transacting, it becomes very expensive and I don't want to be transacting on-chain. So I start downloading them and transact off-chain instead. So this is there's congestion in the in the transaction um, speed or transaction in the market, and how can we reduce that? How can we reduce transactions? How can we reduce congestions so that our transactions can occur within your your market and ecosystem? And lastly, making it safe. What do you mean by making it safe? Firstly, we have no transaction. We don't want to have transactions outside the marketplace. It's like the crypto kitties. We want them to transact on chain and not just go off chain and transact there. And we also don't want to have bad collusion behaviors. What do I mean by that? I mean, you know, just imagine all the bad people come together and they decide to, um, they decide to be validators and validate all bad, bad transactions. We don't want that to happen. We want to make it safe for people, for other people. Uh, we don't want some anyone, any colluding, colluding partners or parties, to gain at the expense of the regular people. It's just rude, right? We don't want that to happen. So we make it safe, and. For, for markets to work well, we have to do experiments, as I mentioned, to diagnose and understand why the market fail, why the market succeeds. And from there, we can make different kind of tweaks, different edits to the design of the market through thickness, congestions, or making it safe. And lastly, something to also consider is the repugnance markets that I told you about, because some markets just don't have monetary values to things. You, it's just a, a social constraint that you don't have, that you just don't have money don't put monetary value to things. So without monetary value, how can we how can we still work well? How can we still design these markets? So they don't always occur. Uh, it occurs once in a while, but it's an important factor to consider. And the other thing is also something that's really important is that you whatever we're talking about, it's within the, the market and within the ecosystem, within the market that we're designing, right? But at the same time, it's important to understand that there are opportunities, there are behaviors opportunities and incentives outside of the marketplace that we're designing and they will affect the behaviors of people because people are are not constrained by the actions they can do within the ecosystem there are a lot of things outside of the ecosystem a lot of things off chain that that needs to be taken into consideration when you're designing your your markets because they could be one of the, the reasons for failure because if you're not incentivizing people enough to transact within your ecosystem there are better opportunities out there people would just go out there because people are intrinsically selfish they want to they will do the best action that gives them the best rewards 
So this is something to also consider when you're testing your markets. So what is thickness? Let's do a quick understanding of thickness. So a market provides thickness when it makes a lot of potential transactions available. Many relevant offers can be compared. It has network externalities. So the, the main issue is that it, it lies in network externalities. So um, ideas being shared together, um, research being shared together, um, IP, IP that can help each other to, to, to promote each other, and also uh, economies of scope. So the difference between economies of scope and economies of skill is that economies of scope talks about um, having more variety and for people to choose, which is related to the second point of having relevant offers to be compared. So an example would be, let's take Airbnb as an example for these three factors. So Airbnb, for Airbnb to be thick, you need to have a lot of potential rooms and, and, and yeah, rooms available. And it's not just in one city, but in all the major cities around the world. Have more than just one room, a lot of options available. And people can compare them easily. People can compare, okay, um, this has two bathrooms and that only has one bathroom. And this has like three beds and that's like two beds plus one sofa bed. And they can compare these options um, easily. And network externalities is not just about the rooms available, but maybe is it an apartment, the entire apartment that you take by yourself? Or maybe it's a shared apartment, you're just taking the room, and then you can interact with a local that lives there. And the person can share with you all the things that you can do in the city. And economics of scope is the kind of variety. It can be apartment, it can be a villa, it can be um, like a campsite, it can be a hotel. There's so many options available on, on Airbnb that it, allow, it allows thickness to form. The other thing is reduced transactions. So a market is uh, reduced, reduced congestion. Um, a market is congested if there's insufficient time to consider and evaluate all the options available. Or maybe, so one problem is that there's not enough time or resources to evaluate the options. The other thing is there are no options at all. It also could be there are too many options that, you know, it's probably not even relevant, but it's just there. And, or low, low transaction throughput rates. So a transaction has, a transaction is a problem of markets with, with the different ways to cause congestions to happen. So for example, during, um, it, for Airbnb, maybe it's just way too many options that it gets very overwhelming for people. And, or maybe it's peak holiday season, like try booking an Airbnb during Christmas time in New York. It's very difficult to, to book because everyone is going there for, for Christmas time. And it's, um, the rooms are all sold out and there isn't a lot of options available. So there are a lot of problems when market failure occurs, or there are a lot of problems and congestions that will cause market failure to occur. And lastly is the ease of use. So if it's too risky for, for participants, uh, if it's too risky to participate in the market, then individuals will try to manage that by, by having very selfish, um, self, selfish or bad behaviors will occur. And, and this is not good because they may, they may benefit themselves at the risk of harming the ecosystem as a whole. So that's something that we don't want it to, we don't want hap happen. Or maybe, you know, if they transact outside of the marketplace or they, now you prevent other people from receiving the offer. So with every me example, you have, if I allow someone to book my place without going through the platform, then I'm reducing this option for other people to choose and book my place. And because of, of um, a lot of things are now digital, we can also kind of start to measure safety in code. It can be in the cryptography um, kind of mechanisms they have in place. It can be the uh, security that they have in place. It can be the algorithm they have in place. We can measure safety in code. So another example, uh, in, in other examples of, of safety and ease of use in Airbnb is uh, we have a very clean layout that you can it's easy to use. You can either choose based on the kind of neighborhood you want, based on the map and roughly where the places are, or you can choose based on the pricing that you're interested in, based on the reviews by people, based on super holes. Yep. Very easy and clean layout for you to navigate around. Or it can be 
um, var various payment gateways. You can use um, credit card, debit card, whatever currencies that you want. It's all available. It's very easy to use and it's safe to use because, for example, um, I don't want to. I want to pay in a specific currency, and I can do that. It's safe and easy for me to use. It also has twenty four hours uh, customer service. So maybe I feel unsafe because the host is quite a creepy dude. Then I can call customer service. They can help me to to move to somewhere safer. So there are many ways to increase safety and ease of use for people, and to encourage then. With that, you can encourage more activities on the ecosystem itself. So, that's all very nice theory, and that's all, that's all good to know. But this is the important thing. How can we apply market design to token ecosystems? Because at the end of the day, we want to apply them to your token ecosystem. We want to apply them for you to design good systems, good, good marketplaces. So, first is, is thickness. How, how, can we, uh, how can we improve thickness in your token ecosystem? So, for example, we can look at the distribution protocol. So, we can incentivize, um, we can, this is, I don't know what they call it, some people call it the, the Nakashimoto uh, or Satoshi protocol, where um, at first you have a lot of rewards and then you have it by X number of, of period. So, we can incentivize participation through this kind of very interesting um, distribution protocol. We can encourage more people to join at first. We reward them from joining early. Uh, for adopting a, a, adopting the platform earlier and because it's quite risky we reward them higher so it's a risk versus reward we can also incentivize um, participation through um, this kind of reward system the other thing is partnerships so we, we can we can attract people uh, participants into the ecosystem not just by okay uh, please come and join our ecosystem but we can also start to do that with partnerships, by having credibility, by by having a lot of options and partners in the ecosystem that they can reach out as participants. So this is examples of all the partners for the Libra coin by Facebook. And look, there's so many partners available. So because we're talking about two sided market places, maybe maybe in the ideal world, all of them will accept um, the Libra coin. So now. As an, as an individual, I'm incentivized to want to join this, this uh, Libra ecosystem, which adds to the thickness because more participation, because I can use them in so many platforms. I can take Uber and pay in Libra. I can um, pay, pay Libra in eBay. Um, I can go to Spotify and instead of paying, paying my monthly fees, I can pay it in, in Libra points. So this, this entices um, people to, to want to join the ecosystem because uh, to, to join your market because there's so many available partnerships, uh, so many available use cases. And partnerships is not just about the, the business side because it's a two-sided platform. It can also be, we can also look at how do we incentivize, how can we attract people from the consumer side. So there are different kind of partnership models that we can, uh, feel free to discuss and then we can discuss in the comments below. And lastly is bonuses. So there are two Big kind of bonuses, or maybe three big kind of bonuses. The first one is referral. So um, if I'm in an ecosystem and I refer you to come in, and then uh, we will get some referral bonus. Could be airdrop bonuses. This is quite popular for a while, where you just go to conferences and people will just airdrop you all the coins that they have. Or it could be a sign up bonus, when if you buy like X number of tokens, then you get plus how many bonus. So it helps to increase thickness. Because especially with airdrop and the, the referral thing, you are attracting more people to come in and use the ecosystem. With um, the, ref, the ref, uh, with the sign-on bonus where you buy like a thousand tokens and you get for every thousand tokens you buy you get ten free tokens. Then those free tokens probably you know to incentivize you to share because it's free anyway. Then as a buyer, then I want to maybe give it to someone else and encourage them to join the platform as well. So there are many different ways to increase thickness, and these are just some of the ways. There are a lot more ways that we can brainstorm and we can we can uh, we can encourage more people to come in. And something that's important to to note is that this when we talk about thickness, it's related to network effects. It's like step one to getting network effects. You know, when you're building thickness, ultimately you want to build your your different kind of network effects, different types of network effects. But what we want to look at thickness here is that. It, it has to be sustainable. It has to be focused in the long term and not short term hypes where 
oh, uh, airdrop and everyone can, can get a lot, everyone can, can just get some tokens, but no one's using the tokens. No one is, is actually uh, utilizing your platform. You're just distributing out and people are just keeping it. So that's not real fitness. That's like a very short term fitness thing, but not a long term real growth in the thickness of your ecosystem. So there's something to keep in mind. The other thing is congestion. How do we reduce congestion? The first one is what we can look at ways to govern uh, transactions. So one thing is that there are too many transactions going on and, and too many people want the transactions to be validated. Everything is just cropped up there. There's a bottleneck, so much transactions. So what can we do? We can do stuff like um, we can grade transactions. We can remove low quality transactions. We can increase the, the, the size of transactions. We can uh, meter the bandwidth of transactions. There are many ways to govern transactions. If transactions is the reason for your congestion. Or maybe it's because uh, it's, we, can, we can also do things like, like charge fees. So there is, let's say there are only a few lanes and every, for transactions to, to pass through. And everyone is just, everyone's like a little car. Everyone wants to go through and it's just too many people, too many, too many cars, too little space. So what can we do? We can maybe start having transaction fees or congestion fees. Like, we can start having congestion fees. We can start having excess fees. We can charge different types of fees available so that it reduces people from being on the road or being trying to get, uh, trying to go through the transaction, trying to transact. Or lastly, we can govern the validators. So, for example, we can have a fixed set of validators for consensus, which is your our DPoS, the Delegated Proof of Stake that we talked about. An example of this would be EOS. EOS that project has, um, I think, thirty or fifty delegated proof of stake uh, valid, delegated validators that can validate transactions. We can randomly select groups of nodes for consensus. So uh, Cardano and Definity does that, where it has uh, this random beacon thing, and it would just randomly select groups of nodes and you have a few sets of these groups of nodes to get consensus, just different types of consensus uh, mechanisms. Or we can have, we can specify super nodes with authority. So uh, MakerDAO has that where you have different layers of governance and there's, there are like super nodes or uh, master nodes. Some different projects have different names, but master nodes as well, where they can govern, they have authority to govern transactions and govern uh, the validators. Or you can have a proof of authority notary notes. So this is more for um, private chains like Coda and Hyperledger Fabric, where it you have a different type of, of authority to, to the governors or to the, the validators. So these are just different ways to reduce congestion. And this happens when you have too much thickness. So this is just something to consider as your system continues to grow and a lot of transactions starts to happen. And lastly, it's safety and ease of use. So first one, so we want to make it easy for people to join and make it safe for them to use the system. So firstly, is to have information transparency. So what we, this is also called a reduction in, in information asymmetry. So where one person has more information than the other. So how can we in increase information transparency? How can we share more information with the parties before transacting. Uh, staking, so we can, uh, proof of stake is one of them. We can stake safety deposits. We can, um, staking is also having skin in the game. So people will less likely misbehave. And if I expect people to misbehave less, then I feel safe to be to want to use the system. So examples of this would be um, Algorand and Ethereum. These are blockchain platforms. Safety features, so uh, you've got privacy mechanisms like um, zero knowledge proof ZKP. Um, Corda uses that. Zcoin uses that. Zcash uses that. A lot of privacy coins use that uh, zero knowledge proof. You also have um, you have stuff like Monero where they have ring signature uh, ring signatures like Monero. It's different types of privacy features. You can also look at the cryptographic agility. So these are these are more technical stuff where um, post like quantum post quantum uh, security or compatible with specific hardware to make sure that it's unbreakable, not just unbreakable software, but unbreakable hardware and uh, 
and how do you increase uh, the crypto? How do you reduce chances of them breaking your, your cryptography? And lastly, it's peer reviewed paper. So I know there are a lot of papers out there, but there are very little papers that actually that is being peer reviewed. So so far I've heard of, I think so far there's only um, Cardano that is peer reviewed that I've seen. The rest of them are usually just. Uh, no, I think Sweetbridge also has peer-reviewed papers. So you, you don't really see a lot of peer-reviewed papers. Peer-reviewed papers are just papers that are reviewed by um, other academics so that it adds to the credibility and, and safety of the ecosystem because now it's reviewed by some by uh, independent third party. So that these help to these are different ways to encourage or uh, to increase safety and also ease of use of your tokens in the ecosystem.